Hey guys, what is up? It's Dusty here, and welcome back to another crypto video. Today we're going to be talking about partially, I guess, a part two of SEC versus Ripple and everything that we kind of know about the situation. It's kind of a part two to our previous video, but it's also a standalone video because you didn't have to watch it to understand this one. We just saw an article get posted on Cointelegraph which reads, SEC versus Ripple, a predictable but undesirable development. And it really goes in depth, in real, real depth, about this whole lawsuit and what kind of the chances are, what the odds are, and why this is all happening, and we'll cover this today. I also don't want to give you guys some more backstory as to why I think that everything will most likely turn out fine while also addressing the risks that are involved as I'm not a financial advisor, these things can go wrong, and XRP winning is not a certainty. I must say it is not a certainty. Having said that guys, we are giving away 250 XRP the first time a video hits 1500 likes within 24 hours, and all you have to do is make sure you press the like button, make sure you are subscribed, and make sure you comment something down below. Also, check out Webull if you're from the US because you can get four stocks for free and a stop on domains to pick yourself up a couple of cool crypto or dot crypto or dot zil domains, which I personally really, really like. I bought 24 of them and I recommend just kind of diversifying your money, right? So check it out. Link down below. All right. Such regulation by enforcement does indeed run the risk of stifling important and valuable innovation in the crypto space. So I'm going to just kind of nitpick here a couple of things that I need to talk with you guys about. And the start here, kind of the introduction is very important. So we're going to read that wholly or fully. The US SEC has not been kind to crypto in the past year. In March 2020, in the SEC v. Telegram case, the commission won a worldwide injunction against the proposed issuance of grams by Telegram, undoing years of innovative work, even in the absence of any allegations of fraud. Then, on the last day of September 2020, Judge Alvin K. Hellerstein dashed the hopes of Kick Interactive by ruling in the favor of the SEC's motion for summary judgment in SEC v. Kick Interactive, halting the sale of Kin Crypto tokens. And both of these actions were filed in the Southern District of New York. On December 22, 2020, the SEC decided that it was time to initiate another high profile action, filing the same district against Ripple Labs and its initial and current CEOs. Christian Larson and Bradley Garlinghouse, respectively, for raising more than $1.38 billion through the sale of XRP since 2013. Uh, I actually thought it was like Bradley with an E in the middle here. And there's a couple things which I find interesting because I, I'm kind of wondering, didn't they really switch to Ripple instead of Ripple Labs a couple of years ago as well? Just kind of wondering about the, the ins and outs of this actually, but all right. The initial fallout from this action has been swift and severe. 24 hours after the lawsuit was filed, the price of XRP was down about 25%, and this has still left XRP un, uh, ranked fourth on coin market cap with a total market of 10.5 billion. All right, that's kind of the back end of it all. Then here we go into the complaint. And now I kind of feel as if you guys all already understand the complaint because we've covered the lawsuit on multiple occasions here, I think like five times before already, and it's basically that they are giving out investment contracts. And Kind of the only way that they can measure this is due to the Howey test. If you don't know what that is, look it up. And basically, if it kind of conforms the Howey test, then it is a security. If the Howey test applies and it you know, doesn't work, it isn't. You should just check the Howey test out here. We can just press it really quickly. What is the Howey test? Uh, let's see. Did I just have a sum up? Mm, okay. Howey test explained. I, I mean, just pause it or something like that. I don't want to give this too much attention because we've covered this at least 50 times in the past before. Then there's a history on XRP, which I don't recommend you guys to read. Um, one only important part about this, which I kind of thought about then was if you look at Ripple Labs, where they actually say that the Ripple Labs changed their name to Ripple, which kind of got me thinking, like, what is the official name? Because, um, I mean, it says here, OpenCoin changed the name to Ripple Labs. And a little bit later, they changed the name to Ripple officially. Here, right here, the company rebranded to Ripple, but maybe they didn't officially change names, but they just are now like Ripple here, even though it's Ripple Labs Inc., which was interesting to me. Uh, again, there's some quotes needed for that possibly as well. Point is, because that's not important, I also kind of forgot the amount of funding that was actually been done by Ripple. Ripple actually had one of the biggest funding rounds ever. The Series C here was $200 million worth, and I kind of feel as if we were forgetting the fact that they also have billions of dollars now worth of funding. And whenever these companies invest so much, 
they very often, even though they're not the chairman or anything like that, they have a, a part in it because SBI, for example, has a part in it. They also contribute to getting things arranged properly and getting these lawsuits arranged properly. Now, again, we cannot say that these guys will save Ripple, surely, because with Tele uh, Telegram, the ICO there and the kick, they had proper advisors, they had proper backing, they had the, the guys, right? And still, they got dismissed. However, I do think these guys are you know, quite different, but we shouldn't forget that they have a lot of funding behind them. And they have been here for years as well. They've been doing this for years already. Now, one thing that kind of scares people around, I think, is actually one part here, and that is on May 2015, Ripple received a $700,000 fine or a civil money penalty from the U.S. Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network for willful violation of the Bank Secrecy Act by acting as a money service business without registering with FinCEN. And I kind of feel as if that might put people off the hook or get people a little bit scared. On the contrary here, on June 2016, Ripple obtained a virtual currency license from New York State Department for Financial Services, making it the fourth company with a bit license. I kind of feel as if these guys have actually gone over Ripple so often in the recent past that, I mean, they should have kind of known about this all along, right? Or at least for a longer while. I also kind of question whether or not McCallop has actually quoted on any of this as he is a co-founder of Ripple and XRP, we all know that. But he most likely has never said anything about XRP being a security, as that would first of all also really destroy XLM. Uh, he second of all could not sell his coins anymore. And third of all, I just don't think he believes that. All right, I just kind of don't think that's his opinion about things. I was kind of also looking between everything that you guys have said on the comment section. For example, somebody said here, I also saw earlier on the other channel, the point that the statute of limitations is expired past the five-year limit for the case two. I looked it up, uh, not the case, all right? So anybody who's saying, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, not the case, all right? Doesn't apply as it only applies from when the last crime was committed, which was within the five-year limit, as it's actually an ongoing situation. Uh, some have said, man, since all that they're talking about here is about 2013, it doesn't apply, but that's not true since every kind of crime that they've been alleged for or kind of talked about, I don't know, not from the U.S., guys, my English is not perfect. Um, they actually are in the lawsuit talking about an ongoing thing. So even in 2020, if you literally look at it. And Red Specialist just said it was extended. So it doesn't really matter, in my opinion. All right. You can say, okay, this statute of limitations has expired um, because it's past five years. But then again, it just depends on kind of where you want to fetch that from because some have said it has been uh, extended to 10 years and some others have said well it's about an ongoing thing so that's also not the case i've been reading so many freaking uh many of these articles and, and type of situations here's class action alleging xp is a security survives critical motion to dismiss this is from a couple months ago by the way all right this was about the idea uh, that in 2017 things were quite different i have been looking through the lawsuit here this is page eight and here you can see for example on july 25th 2017 the sec issued the report of investigation Pursuant of section or to section 21A of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the DAO advising those who would use DL, oh, it's actually that, <laughs> I thought it would be technology, distributed ledger or blockchain enabled means for capital raising to take appropriate steps to ensure compliance with the U.S. federal security laws and find that the offering of digital assets at issue in that report were investment contracts and therefore securities. Again, conform the Howey test. But I kind of felt as if, okay, this has been going on since 2017, this specific thing. They could have also kind of gone after Ripple back then, but they didn't. I kind of felt as if, like, well, <clears throat> there was some action going on between Ripple and the SEC, right, back then. And, again, all the security claims. Yes, there was. Here you can see this article right here. Ripple says XRP lawsuit based on unsupported lease of logic. It's actually true that in 2017, Ripple was already sued by somebody, not specifically the SEC, but the SEC knew about it. Uh, for being a security and the motion was dismissed. I asked on Twitter if it was successful. I kind of think it is, as you can see right here. Class action alleging XCP is a security survives critical motion to dismiss, but it didn't really go further. So I kind of feel as if the motion still helped it kind of stop <laughs> because I've never heard anything come out of this anymore, out of the lawsuit, and it kind of feels as if it's been negated. If you take a good look at it though, I mean, a lot of this is based upon the fact that Garling House sold and the Howey test. I still see everything come back to that Howey test. 
Yet again, consider they also won this case, which is talking about XRP being security, and they may so do so once more since, again, these guys have been knowing about it, but they haven't done anything about it, which may run very bad. And this, by the way, is that whole lawsuit from before. Another huge one, but not as huge, of course, as the one from the SEC. But there's some interesting points in this one. For example, talking about XRP being a security, and in my opinion, also the fact that I kind of wonder how the SEC is going to compensate people who have bought into it. And again, more on this I'll keep on talking about over on my Twitter. I, for example, here pointed up or pointed out quite a lot of kind of um, points here, which I think we can conclude about what the SEC right now is doing. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the SEC is not really helping people. They're not doing this for the people and they have kind of some strange motives. But if you go on with this article here, which was very much important, we just keep going on here. XRP came under, you know, under... Uh, how do you call that? Uh, like under somebody's eyes, investigation a little bit earlier because of a breach. So they're not new to this whole ordeal. At the same time, noted in the SEC's complaint from 2014 through the third quarter of 2020, the company sold at least 8.8 .8 billion XRP coins, 1.38 billion dollars worth. And in addition, the complaint asserts that from 2015 throughout at least 2020 March. While Larson was an affiliate of Ripple as its CEO and later chairman of the board, Larson and his wife sold a ton of XRP. And the basic point is, these guys, like Ripple has said, we use XRP to fund operations, right? They've told us that. But if they literally used XRP to fund that specifically, that was the main goal, if that's their purpose, then conform the Howey test that, that, that there's a security at least. Again, we can kind of discuss for days about whether or not that should be true, but that's the way it goes. A lot of people said, well, like even I, that is kind of conform every foundation as the main purpose of the foundation is to have some coins to use that for ecosystem development. But then comes the question, if Ripple as a company uses this too, then where does it go wrong? And also another question is, who really made XRP? Was it really officially Ripple? Because of course they are made separately, but then gifted. And was that distribution fair at the start? Because for example, with Bitcoin, you can say it's a security because, well, it is decentralized in nature and consensus, but... Yeah, if the person at the start were to give himself, you know, all the Bitcoin at the start, and then the distribution was, I guess, a little bit more um, decentralized, but at the start, all the Bitcoins were for him, would it then truly be decentralized? Well, yes, of course it would, because the consensus is decentralized, and that's all that we care about. However, in this case here, these guys, the SEC, are taking the kind of the spread of the coins and the sales of the coins as some SEC-related thing, which I personally don't really get, even though I've read their lawsuit fully. But here, this article says, XRP is not like Bitcoin or Ether, which I disagree with, but let's see. The preceding description paints a picture of a digital asset that is widely held by persons scattered around the globe. In the case of both Bitcoin and Ether, this kind of decentralization was apparently enough to convince the SEC that those two digital assets should not be regulated as securities. As Director Bill Hinman of the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance explained in June 2018, quote, <clears throat> If the network on which the token or coin is to function is sufficiently decentralized, where purchases would not no longer reasonably expect a person or group to carry out essential managerial or entrepreneurial efforts, the assets may not represent an investment contract. And that's already where we kind of go into the, the wrong side, because Ethereum has a foundation right? And Ethereum's foundation does work on Ethereum. So does Bitcoin. So they work on that. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, it's really, hmm, there's no, you look at this one. I, I, I don't know how to phrase it properly. Here they're saying where purchases would no longer reasonably expect a personal group to carry out essential managerial or entrepreneurial efforts. Every crypto has that. With Bitcoin, you're, you're looking at Bitcoin core developers. With Ethereum, we're looking at Ethereum developers and we're expecting a group to work on that. Same for Cardano, for example, we are always work, kind of expecting a group to work on it because otherwise your ecosystem is just kind of broken, right? If nobody's going to work on it, only volunteers without kind of a, a reward for it because, well, they're not going to do it as properly as somebody who actually has the money for it or who we centrally decide to give the money. And with centrally, I mean, just we all decide on it, not just one central authority decides. The assets may not represent an investment contract. Moreover, when the efforts of the third party are no longer a key factor for determining the enterprise success, material information asymmetric recede. As a network becomes truly decentralized, the ability to identify an issuer or promoter to make the requisite or requisite disclosures becomes difficult and less meaningful. The network on which Bitcoin functions is operational and appears to have been decentralized from some time, perhaps from inception. 
applying the disclosure regime of the federal security laws to the offer and resale of Bitcoin would seem to add little value, which I do agree with for Bitcoin personally, but I do also agree that XRP follows that rule since I kind of feel as if if Ripple were to step out, XRP would survive and would do good. If we really wanted to, which can maybe be proven by Ripple, I think they might be able to prove it. If we wanted to, we could actually create a system where Ripple literally has 0% control. Trust me when I say that it's really strange, but it's possible. Since XRP, oh, sorry guys, since Ripple Labs, let's say that way, has less than 20% of the total validators, it is theoretically speaking possible to create a new network where Ripple has 0% ownership. And that might sound strange, but as an 80%, you can actually rule out another percentage by uh, let me let me call you guys and or let me kind of paint an easy picture here. What validators basically do is they validate transactions, right? So if you're thinking about a blockchain here, if you make a transaction, who knows that you really made that, right? That that kind of system is of course done through the validators here, and they all communicate with each other. But there's also a thing which is called the unique note list, which is basically just a kind of trusted list of validators which you should use to kind of let everything be on par. And if you use that list as an individual or as a group, and you all kind of abide by the list or kind of small deviations with the core members being the same, you're almost certain to not have double spending because nobody's going to really deviate too much from that list. And if all those line up together, you're, you have a high likelihood of things being right. If all these validators though, and again, a lot of these, um, I don't know the name for it in English, a lot of these choices are done with an 80% higher high, um, agreeance rate. 80% of the people have to say yes, 20% can't say no, it doesn't matter what they do, and they have to hold that for two weeks. If they, as an 80% were to say, hey, we want Ripple's, let's say, 17% to be locked out completely, they could actually do that because they could, for example, all go towards a newer list to exclude Ripple. If they were to, for example, all come together, which won't happen, but let's say, all come together saying, hey, let's exclude Ripple from having power, they could get that done. All right, it might take some time, but they could get that done. Same for the amount of XP that Ripple has. They could get that just kind of rid of that. They could decide as a network to get rid of it altogether because, well, you're 80% of the network and that's who make the rules. Ripple can't do that on their own, which kind of makes me wonder once more, how can that be an investment contract if they don't really decide what happens with it? They just can decide what they can do with the money that they have but the real network itself, they cannot really fully regulate. They cannot do anything that they'd want. They can ask favors, they can ask the community to do it, but they cannot inherently do it themselves. And if you say, well, they could at one point, you can kind of say the same thing about other platforms out there because almost all of these have some centralized nature. Because at the start, you don't really have that much diversification unless, again, we're talking about a new 2020 project which has some uh, better... Um, arrangements, but really back in the day, a lot of these were more so centralized than they are right now. Same for Ripple. You know, you, you get these more decentralized but time as you expand. But, you know, in that degree, I also feel as if they're not really that different. But he said, this kind of analysis did not really work for XRP, most of which continues to be owned by the company that created it, where I think this person fails to see the difference, but let's see where the company continues to have significant influence over which nodes will serve as trusted validators for transactions, and where the company continues to play a significant role in the profitability and viability of the asset. Part of that role now, of course, involves responding to this latest SEC initiative. Okay, a couple things, right? First of all, I personally feel as if this is skewed, as Ripple does have an influence over which nodes will serve as a trusted validator for transactions, as they do have a recommended unique node list. So they can give you a recommendation of which nodes to trust and basically what, what system uh, it should be working with, basically. However, that does not actually mean that they represent a big part in this. It means that they have an influence because people use them as a judgment line, but that's not really a bad thing, I personally find, because if these are the most trusted, then it doesn't really matter, as these trusted parties, once more, still do not include Ripple in that sense. Or if it's truly decentralized, which I think it is, it should still have Ripple having a small part in this, I would say not more than 25%, which I personally still think they do not have. Having said that, they play a significant role in the profitability I still kind of feel as if that's a positive thing, though, because there's a lot of these platforms out there, like, for example, Cardano. I, I come up with that one quite often because it's one I like, but it does have the same type of issues. And the same thing for Ethereum, if it were to not be as far into its development. 
The Cardano Foundation, for example, may incentivize others to come on as well. Same thing for Tron, right? They may incentivize people, for example, developers, to hop on and create things. Now, the bigger question comes with, would a platform be able to do that on its own without interference? So that's up to debate. Because yes, people can use XRP without the incentive, but I mean, it really re revolves a little bit about the incentive because that's what we heard from the start. Maybe if the incentive wasn't there, it could have actually gone from its own. But now that it is there, it's kind of hard to think away from it. But you could also see it in a different sense. Maybe if Ripple were to be go all together, XRP could still actually do good because maybe they would still adopt it. We don't know. It's about the idea though. Could it happen? Theoretically speaking, it could, even though, again, it's not a high likelihood of it actually happening. Uh, but that kind of proves my point. Like this guy who wrote it, it's definitely an opinion. And I think it's definitely skewed as this part here already is kind of stupid, especially if you consider this one, most of which continues to be owned by the company that created it. It does not really matter at all for centralization. It matters for centralization how the governance is being done, not what the, um, what the spread looks like, basically, of the coins. As I said before, the allocation, yeah, we can say that is centralized. Consensus, though, I don't think is centralized at all, which I've explained 10 times in this little video right now. The court's probable reaction, and that's, again, where it comes really interesting. Unfortunately for Ripple, that's how they start, which is interesting to me, and its former CEO's blah, blah, blah. The SEC has a strong case that XRP fits within the Howey investment contract test, derived from the 1946 Supreme Court decision in SEC v. W.J. Howey. So again, this kind of confirms what we said before, confirms. The SEC can only sue guys to get things arranged, and this Howey test is from 1946, which makes no freaking sense. This test holds that you have bought a security if, here are the four rules, you make an investment, money, or sorry guys, let me let me quickly go back here. Man, it's freaking 5 a.m. I'm tired as a, as a truck. I don't know if that's an easy thing to say. I'm just trying to update you guys because I've been so involved here. I've been reading for freaking hours and I'm so interested in getting to the bottom of all of this. But all right. One, make an investment. Two, of money or something else of value. Three, in a common enterprise. Four, with the expectation of profits. Five, from the essential managerial efforts of others. And it will follow possibly five... Sure. Uh, one, sure, because you're making an investment, you're buying something. Uh, but then again, is currency, is buying fiat an investment? Hmm. Is buying a currency an investment? Depends on how you view it, right? Hmm. Of money or something else of value? Well, one and two, okay. Three, of a com in a common enterprise? Well, uh, I guess we can also say that one, okay. Four, with the expectation of profit? Ah, that's where we go into the wrong, though. You know why? Because we're talking here about the expectation of profits in a common enterprise. But that also means that the common enterprise, mostly, in my opinion, has to actually give those uh, expectations of profits or from the managerial efforts of others within the common enterprise with the expectations of profit. They, they, Ripple would then have to kind of come out and say, hey, you know, buy this, you're going to be good. Hey, buy this, we're giving you an investment contract, we're expecting it to go up uh, and you should buy it. Or they would want to go about it that way, which you're not doing. So four could definitely not hold up. I really don't think that anybody could really say that that's one that they're going over and saying that's not true. I mean, there's been a multiple multitude of cases here with, that I've read today where people are saying that Ripple has misled people, which, okay, might not be disputable because statements can always be misleading in its true essence. If I say, hey, I'm buying something, you could say, well, it's misleading because you didn't say you you where exactly you bought it at or what you were buying or that it's a it's a risk. You know, all those things can be misleading. Maybe I didn't say I, I was really paid to say that thing when the payment was actually an indirect thing of yada, yada, yada. It can go on for a couple of days here. People will always say that things are misleading. But the bigger question comes to me when you kind of think about the fact that Ripple has given expectations of profit. I don't think Ripple actually goes out to say, hey, buy XRP, you'll make profit. And XRP is part of Ripple. If you see what I'm trying to say, like, this is part of us. We are giving this out. Purchase it from us. Purchase our XRP. Well, you're going to make a lot of money. Again, that is to the public, though. The bigger question comes, have they done this in private? That I cannot tell. But again, that comes from the true value of, is it really a decentralized asset in nature? And it's just the allocation centralized, which means that this does not matter. This whole test can be thrown out the window then because, well, if I were to, for example, 
have a lot of XRP right now, I would have, let's say, for example, I'd buy $50 billion worth of coins, right? Again, let's just say that Ripple got rid of their whole escrow and I bought it all because it got to the free market. Or now, let's say it was burned altogether and I would have just buy all the remaining XRP piece by piece. I'd have $30 billion. Would it all of a sudden be a security then if I were to have it all? It doesn't work that way, does it? Here, they're going to be saying again, Ripple raised more than $1.4 billion from the sale of XRP, so it is abundantly clear that the purchasers were paying something of value. Yep, true. Moreover, as there was no effort to limit purchasers to the amount of XRP that they might reasonably use for anything, other than investment purposes, the element appears likely to be present as well. The fact that the fortunes of all investors rise and fall together, along with the value of XRP in the marketplace, should satisfy the commonality requirement. I don't agree with that. I just agree with a... I mean, yeah... I don't agree with this one in the sense that it is common, yet that's also because there is a certain dependence, right? Logically, there is a certain dependence going on because once more, if my fund, if I were to create a fund right now and I have a huge amount in XRP, I'd buy most of it. It'd still not be centralized in consensus and it'd still not be a security. And it's logical that if XRP does bad, then my company does bad if I'm mostly in XRP. And it's certainly not strange that XRP does bad if the big guy like me, who's holding most of it, actually does bad either. But then again, it just depends on how you want to view it all, because that is a requirement of it all. And so it kind of abides by that one, yes, but I kind of feel as if this doesn't make too much sense. The complaint highlights a number of things that Ripple has done to promote profitability, including statements that it has made, all of which suggest that a reason for purchasing XRP is the potential for appreciation the limited functionality of XRP in comparison to its trading supply is another reason to believe that most purchasers were buying for investment, seeking to make a profit, rather than using it. That depends, though, because if you consider it to be a currency, you could also see people want to have this uh, liquidity or the opportunity to go for what Ripple kind of believes is going to be the future. So they don't necessarily say, hey, we're going to go up in value, but we're going to create a lot of use case for this coin. So if you're purchasing this, you might make your life a lot easier without necessarily making money. It's just like, hey, you know, um, I want to create a new, now I can't really give that example. I wanted to talk about a one world currency, for example, or, you know, I guess it's kind of the same sense as CBDCs, right? You're just making something which might be a lot easier for people to use. And if they buy it, you can say it's an investment. You can say it's a speculational piece, but it's mostly just convenience, right? Finally, the significant ongoing involvement and role of the company, especially given its huge continuing ownership interest in XRP, means that there is a strong case to be made that the profitability of XRP is highly dependent on the efforts of Ripple. All of this points to reality that under the Howey test, XRP is likely to be a security. However, we have talked about this Howey test at least 10 times before with XRP, and every time we conclude that it just does not really work out, unless you really push it. Because you can always find the conclusions that you want if you're talking about this freaking 70, 80-year-old test. Ripple's response to this, Ripple's response to the SEC's enforcement action came even before the SEC's complaint was officially filed. And a couple of you guys said in the comment section, these guys, the SEC, have to make it public to the company that they're suing them before uh, before like they, they really sue them. So like, for example, a day before. I said to him, though, to the person who commented that, like, hey, wouldn't that be really strange? If the SEC was accusing somebody of fraud, they'd give that frauding company one day notice before actually making that information public, leaving those guys one day to suit everything out to let everybody sell and to make more money or to get away with that money in some way, shape, or form, right? That's just what I've been thinking about. If you're going to tell them you're going to sue them, why don't you just tell everybody all at once? Why do you have to give them a notice up front? I don't get that one. But that's maybe just a, a rule in the court of law. I just do not know. I'm not knowledgeable enough. I'm not a financial advisor, not a lawyer. Um, where were we? On December 21st, Gong House tweeted out a condemnation of the SEC's planned action, criticizing the agency for picking favorites and trying to limit U.S. innovation in the crypto industry to both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Soon after, Ripple's general counsel, Stuart Alderotti, gave a strong indication of how the company was likely to respond in the pending matter by pointing out that the 2015 FinCEN issue, which he claimed was a government determination that XB was a digital currency rather than a security under the Howey test. Has a point. Has a point. Mm. This, by the way, refers to this ordeal from right here where they got sued. This is kind of confirmed like, hey, you, you are violating something, violating something. And there's a couple of these ones actually kind of regarding that. So you're, you have a currency that you're working with. Same for, I personally find this one right here. 
them getting a virtual currency license from the New York State Department, I kind of feel as if whenever this happened, and also with the FinCEN here, they checked them out, right? They checked Ripple out to see what they're doing. And if they thought they had a security, they would have they would have kind of gotten it out back then. But now they went over and they just gave them more money. And even, again, everybody let these funding rounds go through as well. This is a funding round for 2019. I kind of feel as if somewhere along the road here, some of these guys must have been like, uh, you know what? Or I guess some government agencies should have been like, hey, you know, you cannot invest $200 million in this company because they're a fraud. But no, nothing like that happened all this time. All this time, it didn't happen. Mm, unfortunately, classification as a digital currency does not necessarily preclude regulation as a security. Uh, as another New York District Court decided in 2018, case of CFTC versus McDonald, in the context of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, FDCT, sorry, F, no, CFTC's authority to regulate digital assets, federal agencies may have concurrent or overlapping jurisdiction of a particular issue or area. Thus, even though FinCEN regulates crypto as a digital asset, the CFTC may treat it as a commodity, the SEC may regulate it as a security, and the IRS may tax it as property all at the same time, which I do get, because I do get the US as a very strange system, and I do get, however, that this makes a little bit of sense that different bodies can have different ways of viewing this. But consider this. The SEC has seen Ethereum and Bitcoin as, I guess, proper currencies, right? I kind of feel it, that it's strange because if you really start to look at it properly, then a couple of guys over in China have more control over the Bitcoin or Ethereum network than Ripple has or ever will of XRP. If you kind of think about it that way, it's not like the the the, the decentralization really is the is the, I don't really get these guys, man. I don't really get the guys. I'm just thinking about all these different crypto projects here, which have a foundation, which are trying to push adoption for the coin. Are they all securities then? If I just have an, if I have an interest in the coin then, what makes that a security then? And how can it not be a security ever then? Like, how does that work? What makes the difference there? I really don't get it. I'm still trying to figure that all out. Even though I've been working on this for hours upon end, Literally, I think I've spent 20 hours in the last three days just figuring all this stuff out, and I still don't get it. But I definitely learned a lot about U.S. law. Your country is so freaking weird, man. I don't get it. Uh, and then the conclusion, this comment should not be taken as approval of the SEC's current approach and re relative hostility to crypto offerings. As the SEC's complaint notes, the XRP sales that are now being questioned took place over many years. The initial sales date back to 2013, which had happened considerably before the SEC first publicly announced its position that digital actions should be regulated as securities if they fit within the Howey investment contract analysis, which did not come until 2017 with the DAO report. Moreover, since 2015, Ripple has been proceeding in accordance with its settlement reached with FinCEN. Since that time, Ripple has worked to bring its operations into compliance with BSA requirements, operating as if XRP was actually a, a currency rather than a security. To conclude the conclusion, funny enough, the conclusion is actually very positive, as he goes about here kind of explaining, like, even though the SEC is in their proper right to sue them, which I do agree with, and they have quite a lot of good points, in the end, Ripple actually has a pretty good shot at figuring this out, because they're not really doing anything wrong. I mean, you could talk about the initial sales, but they started these sales in 2013, before the SEC actually ruled any of this out, before they said it was not allowed. Also, within this whole time period, they've actually never said that it was not allowed against Ripple. There's been a lawsuit against Ripple, but they, no, th th those guys that lose to them didn't win. And also, if you check everything from 2017 and 2015 on forward, I guess, Ripple has just been abiding by all the rules that they've been given. They have begged for years for proper regulations that have not been, not been given them. I'm, losing, I, I'm getting a speech impediment here from talking for so freaking long. But they've tried to follow all the rules. They wanted rules. And I just find it strange that the only rules that they can get is just a straight lawsuit against them without just a proper regulation for everybody all at once. No, the SEC has to do it this way. Instead of just kind of arranging with the government bodies to just get proper rules in place, the only way they saw fit now was to sue Ripple, make them an example. And I saw a couple of other articles state that if the SEC sues the founders of a, of a project, they most likely want to go for a kill shot. So the SEC is most likely quite serious about this. But again, consider these guys are not doing it for us. They're just trying to prove a point. Maybe they feel the power. Maybe they feel something. I don't know. Uh, here's some more thoughts. But all right. That was it. All right. That was it for today's video.
all the conclusions we've made, whatever. I'm freaking tired, man. It's 5 something a.m. I think I'm done. We talked for way too long. Way too long on a very special day to me. You guys know about it. Why don't you talk about stimulus as well and about how right now we're just in such a dire need of these systems and they're not allowing innovation. But screw that. I'm going to go head over to bed, man. It's 5 freaking a.m. Crazy. 35 minutes. Long video. But all right. It was worth it. Hopefully, we concluded some cool things. I kind of feel so, though. I, have of course, already have my conclusions set in place before talking about this. But all right. Let me know what you guys think. And I'll see you guys again in another crypto video. Take care and have a very nice day.